Okay, so uh, let's just pick up with something that, uh, two issues that we raised last class. Uh, the first one we sort of resolved, and then the second one uh, we'll, we'll spend some time talking about. Uh, so recall that we're talking about SSL or HTTPS, uh, which is HTTP over SSL slash TLS. And uh, the issue we have is I think I'm connected to, say, Google. Uh, I'm not sure that I'm actually connected to Google. Uh, Google gives me some sort of thing called a certificate, which says that Google.com's public key is actually this particular value. But how is it that I actually know that that's true? Okay, so how is it that I trust that that's actually Google's public key? So we introduce the idea that the certificate would be signed by a party that I trust. So someone else will figure out that that's Google's uh, key and they're going to sign off on it. That's called certificate authority. And then the question becomes, well, if I don't know what Google's public key is, how do I know what certificate authority's key is, right? If there's some third party that can sign off on it, uh, how do I know that that's actually their real public key? So it seems like I didn't really solve the problem. I just kind of pushed it from the end server to the certificate authority. And so the answer there is that my computer will come hard-coded with the keys of certificate authority. So that's how I learn the certificate authority's key. Okay, so I know about 50 companies. Uh, when I bought my computer, even before I connected it to the internet, uh, it just came hard coded. Okay, then we uh, noted that certificate authorities can issue keys, or sorry, certificates for other entities to act as certificate authorities. And so it turns out that there's actually a lot more uh, companies that, that can issue certificates. You don't really see them. The only time you see them is when you actually see a certificate that chains back uh, through them. People have tried to scan the entire internet. Uh, so basically the IPv4 space, uh, they'll, they'll connect to every computer over SSL. Uh, if it speaks SSL, uh, it will send back a certificate and then they'll just note who are the entities that are, are involved in this certificate chain. Uh, and so we, using that kind of mechanism, there's different ways of counting, but you end up with between maybe two or 600 new companies that are providing certificates in addition to the 50 that come hard-coded in your computer. Okay, um, so that's fine. Why is that problematic? Well, any certificate authority can sign a, a certificate for any site. Okay, so if one of those entities, something goes wrong with one of them, then, uh, then you can, whoever the attacker is, if basically if they have control over just one of those certificate authorities, then they can actually issue certificates for any site on the internet, okay? Or if we think of our attack tree, uh, what they can do is they can accomplish this goal essentially. So they can observe traffic sent over HTTPS from a man in the middle position. How will they do it? Well, they'll see that you're trying to connect to google.com. Google's sending back its real public key if you get that real public key, then you'll form a real connection to Google. But what the adversary will do is they'll drop in their own certificate instead. So they'll quickly, they'll take that certificate off the wire and they'll create a new certificate. They'll have their compromised CA uh, sign it uh, and then they'll drop that certificate in. And so all you see is I got a certificate. It says it's for google.com. It is signed by a CA that eventually traces back to one of the root CAs that are in my in my laptop, therefore I trust it. Okay, your browser's happy, it displays the lock and all that type of thing, okay? But re in reality, your, your, uh, the confidentiality of that channel is compromised, okay? There is an adversary in the middle, okay? So we think of this in general as subverting server authentication because you, you aren't speaking to who you're speaking, to, you think you are. In this case, the adversary, they're actually using a valid certificate, quote unquote valid. Valid just means that you're computer believes it's true, um, but it was actually illegitimately gained. So maybe we hacked a CA uh, or we somehow breached its certificate issuance process, which we'll talk about in a second. Uh, maybe we're a corrupt government and so there's a CA that happens to be within our country and so we're using some, some sort of legal mechanism in order to get their private key or, or get them to issue certificates that we want uh, on demand, okay? And what's interesting about this is, well, what's interesting about this is that when we started off by writing down our goal for an attack tree, we probably thought, well, it's going to be a lot of like kind of crypto attacks and that kind of thing. Uh, but in reality, you end up with uh, 
you end up with some uh, things that are like political, uh, which is, is sort of unusual. Okay, um, so I see that uh, maybe it didn't save from last time. So we, we did have add, we did add some attacks to this note as well. Um, I probably just forgot to hit save. So anyway, in my spare time, I'll, I'll re-add all the notes uh, to this particular node. But uh, anyways, for, for the rest of today's lecture, we will be down here in our tree on subverting server authentication. Okay, so this is the first issue. So we went from how do I know Google's public key to how do I know the certificate authority that signed it, their public key. Answer, it comes hard baked in my computer for better or worse. Now here's a second question. So the second question is, okay, great. Uh, I just got a certificate. It's actually signed by a certificate authority. I see that that certificate authority is something my computer trusts. Okay, therefore I trust it, okay? but. How did that certificate authority actually figure out what Google's public key was, right? How did, you know, what process did they use to validate uh, that public key? And whatever process they use, why don't I just use it myself? Like if, if VeriSign, the company, which is a certificate authority, can figure out what Google's proper public key is, why can't I? Like why, why are they better than I am at figuring out uh, whose public key belongs to who? Okay, so what we need to do now is, is think about, well, how is it that a CA actually comes to know what a website's public key is? So Concordia wants a new certificate, that's fine. They're going to go to some company like VeriSign and get it signed. Uh, but like, how does VeriSign know that it's actually Concordia coming to them and not me pretending to be Concordia, right? I know a lot about Concordia, right? I have, you know, access to resources at Concordia. Could I get a Concordia.ca certificate? Like what, what, what do they require uh, before they sign off on these certificates and how do they actually validate uh, that someone is who they say they are, okay? And then why can't all users just use that validation process and then we can just eliminate all CAs, okay? So these are kind of the tricky issues that we, we have to resolve. So let's talk about these now. Okay, so what process do they use? So the process that you probably imagine if you've never looked at this area and you're just like, you know, I can put myself in the shoes of a CA, like what would I look for? You're probably imagining some sort of in-person validation where someone like walks over and maybe they have an employee card or something like that. Uh, maybe there's some documents that are sent. Maybe it's over the phone, uh, but it's kind of like human to human, uh, that kind of thing. Um, and so there's some actual validation that happens, okay? So that does happen sometimes, okay? So that is one way of doing it. Uh, so we can call this in-person validation. It's not strictly necessarily that it's in-person, but, but the point is that there's going to be meetings or phone calls or mail, postal mail that's exchanged, something like that, okay? So it's going to... It's not going to be like an automated computer system where two seconds later you can be holding a certificate in your hand. There's going to be some process, some forms that you have to fill out, that kind of stuff. Um, so this would require some business documentation. Identities, etc. And the end result of this process is you'll get a certificate that's going to say, okay, here's the key, here's the domain for that company, and this is the right key for that particular domain, 
And they'll also say, oh, this company, like not only is it the company that controls Google.ca, which maybe or maybe isn't, you know, Google, the country, the company in Mountain View, California, but they'll actually say, okay, it's, it's actually this company. Okay, so it's, um, it's this company, it has this particular address and all that type of stuff. Okay, so they'll, they'll sort of staple those three pieces of information together uh, and then that's what your certificate will look like. The second way is, um, so this was kind of onerous and like what would happen is, I don't know, people would forget to renew their certificate. So another thing is that your certificate, when you get one, it, uh, it, it used to last longer, but now for security reasons, we, we make them not last very long. Uh, so you might get a certificate for one year, for example, or two years, okay? So whatever, you set up your website, you get your certificate, uh, it's gonna be valid for say one year. And then what happens is a year later, you've totally forgotten about your certificate, right? So you're just, you know, you're walking to school one day and then you start getting emails from people being like, I can't access your website, it's down. It says something about certificate error. And you're like, oh shoot, like I let my certificate expire. And then you're like, okay, well, I'll just renew it. But now I have to like get this documentation and stuff. And like, this is going to take like three days. And, you know, maybe people are buying stuff from me because I have like some e-commerce store. And like if every day I'm losing money, right? So if it takes me three days to renew my certificate, I'm losing money, right? I can't turn SSL off because if I just turned it off, well, I could. But because, you know, I'm taking credit card numbers because I'm selling stuff, you know, that's not secure. Right. So I'm kind of stuck. Right. Like I'm, I'm watching the money disappear. OK. So there was a lot of pressure put on certificate authorities to say, let's have some process that's fully automated, some process where you can do it in two seconds. OK. It just involves machines. No human's going to look at it. Um, that type of thing. OK. So the second way that these get either issued in the first place or renewed is through what we, we call a fully automated process. So there's no humans involved. It's only machines. OK, and in this world, a computer can't figure out whether someone that comes to them is actually Google, the company in Mountain View, California. OK, a computer just doesn't know whether a request uh, is going to come from from an actual company or something like that. So in the fully automated world, we just sort of give up on trying to validate that. But all we do is we try to 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 bind a key to a domain. Okay. So if we use the fully automated process, the CA will use a certain process. I'll, I'm going to describe it in a second. But the end goal of it is just to figure out that this key is really the key that belongs to this domain. So for example, this is really Google.ca's key. I'm pretty confident of that. I don't know that Google.ca is actually owned by Google, the company. Okay. Uh, maybe somebody else registered Google.ca. All I'm saying is that wh whatever server is sitting there at the end of Google.ca, this is their key. And if you connect to it, you at least have a secure connection to that, that computer, to that server, whoever's answering traffic for Google.ca. Okay. Don't know their real world identity. Don't know anything else about it. Um, but anyways, I, I am confident that uh, you have a secure tunnel to at least that server. OK, so that's the guarantee uh, here. OK. So this uh, is sometimes called domain validated uh, because it only validates the domain. It doesn't validate anything else. Uh, sometimes it's called DV for short. This because we're we're Validating more, uh, we call this extended validation. Uh, which is called EB. And there's something in between that's organizational validation. But anyways, I'm not going to get into all the details. We'll just, these two are the simplest cases. Okay, yeah. Sure, no problem. So the key here, good question, is uh, this is a cryptographic key. So it's a cryptography key.
if you get this key correct, you will, the cryptography will work. As long as none of those attacks that we talked about last week work, um, then you will have an actual secure tunnel, okay? Uh, now, specifically, what is this? Is this a, like an RSA key or like, what is it? So don't worry about if you've never taken 6110. If you have taken it, it can actually be one of two things. Um, so it could be an RSA encryption key. Uh, so that's used for a protocol called key transport. Uh, that's now depreciated. So the, the newest version of TLS does not allow you to do that. Um, in the new version, as well as old versions, it could also be a signing key. So a signature key. Uh, so the public key of a digital signature scheme, typically that would be something like ECDSA. Uh, it could also just be normal DSA. It could be RSA. Uh, there's signatures there. But uh, now I think I think in one point, uh, uh, for I think the newest version they they only do ECDSA, but I could be mistaken on that. But yeah, and uh, yeah, so basically you have a signing key that's sitting there. Uh, if you've taken crypto, I'll just say it really quick. Uh, basically, you do Diffie Hellman. You sign, or the server signs all the parameters. So you send your exponent to it. It sends it back. It signs both of them so that you know that you don't get a man in the middle attack. Uh, and then once you have that shared secret, you turn it into some sort of like AES GCM key. And then now you start speaking AES GCM. Yeah. So that's, that's one approach. But the protocol is actually very flexible and it lets you negotiate different kind of cryptographic uh, things that you might want to do. So this key is not shared. This key, only, this, the, only the website knows. So, well, this is the public key. So everyone knows the public key, but the private key that corresponds to this, only the website knows, the CA does not know it, the user does not know it. But once you have that set up, then you can use Siffy Hellman to get a shared key. And that's what you'll actually use for your encryption and Max and things like that. Uh, we talk about domain. So uh, how do we deal with the IP addresses underlying? Uh, we don't. So a certificate doesn't say anything about an IP address. So it binds a key to a domain. If the IP address changes for a domain, you don't have to do anything with the certificate. Okay. Yeah. What uh, Then you will get a certificate. Like if you typed in 8.8.4.4 .4 or whatever slash search, and you, you get directed to Google, but then the certificate doesn't match. So your browser will say, I ha I'm getting a certificate for google.ca, but you went to this IP address. They're not the same. And so it will give you an error in that case. Yeah, so you have to actually, um, and the reason that you don't issue certificates against IP addresses is because they change, right? So if you have an ISP yourself, you'll have an IP address today, or I'm on my phone and I'll like wander, I'll drive around the city, and I'll get a bunch of different IP addresses, or every couple months my IP address changes, right? Um, whereas domains, you register them, you register them for a year or two years or four years or something like that, so they're more permanent. Yeah. But like in domain, the, they are, if it is a highly available website, they will probably have multiple IP addresses behind a domain name. Yeah, so that does not matter. So here, as long as whatever computers are sitting at those IP addresses, they'll all have the same certificate, the same okay. private key, uh, so that they can sign things for that certificate, and then that's fine. Now that does become a bit of a problem. So if you want to do load balancing, that's usually the most common scenario. Then you do have to kind of, you either have to get a different certificate for every computer, or you're going to have a one copy of your key on a bunch of different computers. Someone's going to have to like carry it around and that becomes a bit of a security vulnerability. And then if you want to really like bend your mind, uh, now it's more common to do uh, content uh, distribute distribution network, so like something like Cloudflare or something like that. And so then you have to think about um, if they're serving up the video, like say you're going to YouTube, but you really end up going to like Cloudflare or something like that, um, they have to have that plain text. Otherwise, they can't actually cache that video. And so if they have the plain text, that means they're putting it in the pipe. That means the pipe ends at them. Right, and then how do you? So how do you know you're actually talking all the way to Google.ca? You're actually just talking to Cloudflare, and so that that ends up being kind of a headache. And we won't get into that uh, in this course, but you can read about that. So there are some interesting research papers, and there's some protocols that have been proposed where you can sort of allow. 
people in the middle to uh, that you authorize to kind of insert cash traffic on your behalf, but still be guaranteed that you have an end-to-end -end integrity. And it gets complicated anyways with CDNs. Yeah. If none of that makes any sense, it doesn't matter. It's just a sort of side note. OK, other questions? Yeah. Good question. So we haven't got there yet. Yeah. So we still don't know how we're going to do it. I'm just telling you what, what they're doing. OK, so I'll tell you how they do it in one second. Uh, but before I do, I want to know, how do you know the difference? So it seems like actually in-person validation, that seems kind of better, right? Like if you went to a website that used this process, you might trust it more uh, than if it was this fully automated process. And that's true. Uh, you should probably trust it more. Uh, so how do you know? So like, for example, let's say I go to, let me just go to google.com. So here we are. So here's google.com. I have a lock, so that's great. Uh, did, they, did they do this domain validated process? So does that certificate only say that I'm talking to google.com? Or does this say I'm talking to Google, the company, right? So I can open the certificate up. And you notice that, that they will actually have an address listed, right? So they're like, okay, this is Google LLC, you know, in Mountain View, California. Okay, but just because that information is filled in, it doesn't mean that a human actually sat down and looked at it. Okay, so in the domain validated space, um, the first thing I'll note is that they will say addresses, but no one checks. Okay, so it's just an asserted address. Okay, so just because you see this address here, uh, it doesn't actually mean uh, that, that it was validated uh, by a person, okay? So this is not the indicator uh, that you have. Um, so let me put this in the notes because it's sort of important. So in other words, uh, looking at this, do I know whether this is, is this a DV certificate, domain validated, or is it EV certificate? Okay, and if it's DV, then all of this stuff, well, not the common name. So, so in a DV, basically it's saying, we did check that you're actually being passed through to this exact domain, uh, but we're, we're not really checking this. Okay, this is just an assertion. Okay, so it turns out that this is not an EV certificate. Okay, this was actually just domain validated. How do I know? Okay, so there is a lock there. So the lock says, yes, that, that is a secure. Okay, the color. Uh, so I see a gray lock. What should, it, what should I be seeing? Why a green lock? Okay, so sounds maybe kind of crazy if you've never paused to think about it, but that's actually true, okay? So if your lock is gray, then that means it's DV, and if it's green, that means it's EV. Now, browsers do a little bit more for an EV certificate, so let me show you one. Uh, but we'll note here that this is a gray lock. That actually used to be the only indication, is just the color. Sure, yeah, so that's exactly right. Uh, so let me show you what an EV looks like by contrast. So let's go to Twitter. Once again, not responsible for anything that is in my Twitter feed. Okay, so here uh, you can see that it's green. Okay, so you have twitter.com. And then what some websites will do, sorry, what some, so what the browser chooses to do is up to the browser itself, okay? So browsers can do whatever they want. Um, so different browsers will implement it different ways. Uh, so in Safari, it, they just use the green color. 
uh, as opposed to uh, the gray color. Uh, this is Chrome, so a different browser. So here we have uh, just a normal standard uh, HTTP uh, DV certificate. So it's gray, there's a lock. That's what it looks like. Uh, if we go to Twitter, you'll see that they don't use the green, but what they do is they put the name of the company here. Okay. Uh, so they say this is, you're actually talking to Twitter Incorporated as registered in the country, the United States. Okay. Um, so that's how they indicate to you that we, we're not just validating that you're talking to twitter.com, the domain, we're actually validating that you're, you're talking to this exact company. And it turns out that that name is, has to be a registered business name in the United States. Okay. So I can't go and register twitter.com because the government will stop me. And if I can't register it with the government, then I can't get this certificate. So one of the documents that you would submit would be that, that this is your registered business name essentially. Great. Okay, so you go out, you register your own domain, yourname.com.ca, and you want a certificate for whatever reason. Nobody knows. You're not Google, you're not Twitter, you're not like anyone famous. Uh, so how do you convince, and let's say you want that fully automated. You need that certificate in the next hour. Uh, you're not willing to wait three days. You don't want to go through this big in-person process. It also costs money. Certificates are not always free. And in this space, they're not free. Okay, so you can't get an EV certificate for free. Now we, we have, there are some CAs that uh, will issue these for free if, if they're just domain validated. But anyways, you want to go the domain validated route. How is it that a CA figures out that you actually own that particular domain? Okay, and so there's a couple different processes that are used. So I'll, I'll show you a few of them. They're, they're very similar, but... Uh, so the first process I'll show you, I'll show you this one in detail and then I'll just mention the other two. Uh, so probably the most common is what we're going to do is we're going to use email somehow. Okay, so it's just, we just call it email validation. But forget about email for a second. Let's just think about what's going on. Okay, so here's the process. So you come along, uh, so you want a certificate. for domain.ca. And remember, you maybe you own this domain, maybe you don't. Okay, maybe you're an attacker and you're trying to get a certificate even though you don't own it because you want to read traffic to and from this website. Maybe you are the legitimate owner of the domain.ca. Okay, so the CA's job is to figure out which is, the, which is true. Are you actually the person that owns this or are you someone pretending to be the person that owns this? Okay. And we want to do this in a fully automated way with no humans and just computers. Okay. So what they'll do is the CA will choose a secret value. Kind of like a password or a cookie value or something like that. We can call it X. 
okay? And what the CA will do is they will send an email, an automated, it's just an automated system, but they'll send an email to, and the idea here is they want to send an email to this domain, okay? So they want to send it to this domain, but if you've ever used email, like all of you have, you know this isn't a valid email address, right? Uh, so we need to put something here, okay? And so by convention, uh, what the CA did is they decided that uh, if you own a website, you should probably keep this username reserved for your own use. Uh, and a CA will send it to, for example, admin at domain.ca. Okay? So admin at, at domain.ca is, uh, is this particular email. So hopefully, if you're actually the person that owns domain.ca, you do have this mail account set up. Uh, it's yours, it's only yours, and uh, so you're the only person, only the legitimate owner of domain.ca could actually read this email that just got sent with the secret value X, okay? Uh, then what happens is then the person takes X out of the email, they enter it in the CA's web page usually, uh, so they, um, so the owner, or I'll put you since we're, we're doing it this way, okay, so you, uh, fetch X from email, type it into the CA's website, and then you'll be given a certificate. Maybe you have to pay or whatever, but anyways. Okay, so that's it. Uh, so pretty simple. Uh, is this a good protocol? So it's, it's not actually the greatest protocol. Can anyone think about some reasons why maybe this, this isn't? If we want to think about this from, a, we're doing an attack tree, okay? So now we know the process. Uh, if I want to attack this protocol, what, what are some things I could do? Okay, so, Okay, let's start with phishing. Uh, phishing, I don't think works in this case. Phishing is more like I'm trying to send an email to you to try and convince you that I'm someone who I'm not. In this case, uh, the CA is sending it to a min at domain.ca. Yeah. So there is the network, uh, the and because email is not encrypted. <coughs> okay, is email a secure protocol? Okay, so complicated question, uh, a little more complicated, but in general, there's ac there's no guarantee that it's actually. Okay, so we could steal, okay, so we could intercept the email and steal X, and if you can steal X, then you can steal ownership over that domain. Email is generally not encrypted. If it was encrypted, it would require certificates. And then you're back where you started. How do you get the certificate for your email so that you can get your certificate for your website in a secure way? Okay, uh, so it would kind of push the problem around. Okay, and a lot of people do have a, a wrong mental model of email. We think of it as being sort of secure, encrypted, that kind of thing. Um, the state of email is actually very dismal. Okay, so the uh, email's really in a terrible state where almost no email is encrypted, what we call end-to-end. -end. Um, servers are getting better about doing something called opportunistic encryption, uh, which basically means it is encrypted, but if you were actually on the wire and you substitute in a couple values, then you could defeat that encryption. But if you happen to just read off the wire and make a copy of it, then you can't do anything. So you have to be a sort of what we call an active man in the middle where you have to actually intervene in the protocol. You can't just passively read it and then figure out how to decrypt the email. So even that functionality is not 
always on, uh, but it, it's becoming, it's, it's on more than it used to be. Um, but anyways, uh, if you're an active adversary and you can intercept that email, and we, you probably could. I mean, we started in our attack tree with the assumption that, um, that you're already in a man in the middle position. So you're somewhere along that user's wire. So you're probably on their email wire as well. Uh, and so the, the chances that you can intercept it are, are probably pretty good. And you just do an active attack and then um, you can lift X right out of the email. Okay, is there anything else you could do? Yeah. Is it possible to maybe change the headers like, like from, so from field in the header? So I could like spoof it to say that I'm the admin of so and so site and I'm yeah. the email and Okay, so email also is not secure in terms of if you receive an email, you actually never know who it actually came from. Uh, so you don't have end to end authentication. Now, in this case, um, notice these people aren't sending an email. So you could fake email from a min at domain.ca, but that's not part of the protocol. And the CA here is sending it to the domain. I mean, you could send an email to a min at domain.ca pretending to be the CA, but then you're just going to give it a garbage X value that it'll put in a website. And it's not, it's not going to allow you to get that. So, yeah, so that's a little different. So in that case, what you're trying to do is get it redirected to you. Right, so spoofing is usually I send an email, I put the wrong from address, but that raises a good question. Um, how does the email that's sitting on the mail server of the CA, how does it actually find its way to domain.ca? Okay, so DNS, so what, is, what does that mean? Okay, so what it's going to do is it's going to take domain.ca, it's going to say, I need an IP address for this. And so it's going to go check DNS, okay? And DNS will list the IP address for the server, but it also usually lists the mail address, the mail server. So it could be different uh, depending on how it's set up. Um, and so you're going to get that. That's in a record called MX, doesn't really matter, okay? But this whole thing relies on DNS as well, okay? Um, and if you can change that DNS record so it points at you, then guess what? That email is coming to your inbox. It's not going to domain.ca's inbox. Okay. Good question. Hold on to that. Gonna leave a little space for one. <coughs> okay, so this sounds nice. We'll just change it. Well, if you can just change DNS records, then you can do all sorts of bad things, right? So what stops it? What answer that question? So it was a, a good question. What actually stops me from going to domain.ca and changing it? Not everyone has access to the domains. Like the so what does access mean? So there's no global DNS company. There's a bunch of DNS registrars. So that's true. How does the legitimate owner of domain.ca change their mail address? It's, they can do it, right? So if they can do it, then I could do it. Like, there's what's the difference between them and me? There is a there must be a process for doing it because people are able to do it somehow. Okay, so what's going to happen is, first off, this domain has to come from somewhere. And so that's a process called registration. You can go through one of a million companies, like GoDaddy, for example. Okay, so you go over to GoDaddy and you say, is the main.ca available? And they say, no, do you want to buy it? And you're like, yeah, great. Uh, so you buy it. Okay, then what do they do is they create an account for you. And then they give you access to uh, all the fields that you want to set. And if you ever want to come back and change it, then what do you do? You log in, log in uh, and then you, you can change it. And it may, might take a couple of days for DNS to like circulate that change around. 
Okay, uh, so your registrar is going to do it. Now let's go back. What what did you do? You logged in. What does that mean? Username and password. What if I knew your password for your DNS account? Or could reset it? Oh, then I could change your DNS record. If I can change your DNS record, then I can have your email sent to me. If I can have your email sent to me, then I can get a certificate in your name. Yeah, and where's that email going to go? Because I just changed it. No, it's going to go to... It's going to go to the email at the domain, but that's now me because I just changed it. Yeah. yeah. And even if I do, let's say I log in, I change the password and let's say there's a secondary email. So the person now gets an email saying, oh, by the way, your mail server was just changed. Then they're like, oh, what's going on? Then they try and log in. And it's like your password's been changed. <laughs> right. And so this attack has actually happened in real life. Uh, and, and we'll talk about it uh, later in social engineering. But um, Anyway, so this is absolutely possible, okay? And so uh, here, one thing is I could just, if I would just need your, your password essentially, okay? So if I can guess or reset or steal somehow, like with Keylogger or something like that, uh, your domain registrar password, then I can do a whole bunch of things that will, at the end of the day, get me a certificate for your site. Okay. Now, speaking of passwords, is there any other passwords that if I knew I could? Okay. So what about a min at domain.ca? What stops me from just logging into that inbox? Probably a password, right? Uh, so uh, I could also just steal guess or reset uh, a min at domain.ca password. The mail server password, yeah. Well, okay, so there are two separate things. So this email is actually sitting on a computer somewhere. I could also try and log into that computer, right? So that's the mail server. A lot of times it's open for remote administration. Uh, and so then in that case, I could, that, that would be another thing, okay? Okay, uh, so wildcards do play a role in this, but what exactly do you want to, how is that going to help you here? Okay, okay, so let's circle back to that. So I'll show you an attack that uses wildcards, but it's slightly different than this. So I don't think it will help you get uh, into the email itself. Okay, so I could intercept the email, I seal X, I could just guess the password. No, it's kind of crazy because the whole reason we're using SSL and TLS, it's about cryptography. It's about keys. You know, it's not about passwords. This is like real crypto, real keys. And yet the whole system comes down to passwords, right? If I know a couple of your passwords, then guess what? I can just sidestep all of this cryptography that's happening. Uh, okay, a couple other things that you might not think of. First is I could just guess X itself. So I could just go and start typing in random X's into this website. If I happen to hit the right, right one, then it will say, okay, you must have, have done it. So that's going to depend on how complicated X is. Like, is it a four digit pin or is it like a big long kind of character? So I could do a guessing attack on X. at the CA website. Uh, another thing is, okay, so look at this. So a min at domain.ca. Um, could I get a min at, who owns a min at google.com? Probably like some Google engineers, right? Or a team or something like that. So that's great. Who owns a min at gmail.com? Sorry? Yeah, we, okay, so seriously, could I go and register domain? I mean, I'm sure someone's already done it, but, you know, is admin at gmail.com, like, was that open for, like, someone to come and register? Okay, so with admin, probably not. Okay, Google's smart enough to know that, oh, yeah, we shouldn't allow admin at 
domain.ca, okay? But how did Google know that Amin is a special, this is a special reserved email address and you cannot hand that out, uh, especially for, for like a, a web mail? Or if I went to Concordia and said, I don't want to be j.clark anymore, I want to be Amin at concordia.ca, right? They, they immediately will know, oh, but that's just sort of through kind of common knowledge. Like it's not written down somewhere like, oh, you should never use this uh, particular username. Okay, so admin say at webmail.ca. This is what we call a reserved uh, username. Okay, now admin also, what what is admin? mean? Really dumb question, just say it. Okay, so it's short for administrator. Uh, what language is that? Another dumb question, English. Does everyone that uses the internet speak English? Okay, so is Amin going to be, you know, in China, in India, in Turkey, is that going to be the reserved username? What about all the CAs that are based in these countries that don't even operate in English? Okay, maybe there's other ones like that, right? Maybe a min in some other language is used by some CAs in those countries. Could you get that one at gmail.com? Maybe, right? Does Google know every single uh, reserved thing that a CA is willing? And remember, you just need to get one out of 650 organizations to send that email, right? Um, okay, and so it turns out that there are uh, CAs had their own kind of idea. So everyone kind of used a min, there's some common ones. So some of these are common, like, so like admin, uh, uh, host, master, etc. Okay, uh, but some CAs had their own custom list. Okay, so some CAs would send it to things that uh, other people just didn't know about, right? Because there's no way of kind of spreading this knowledge, right? So some CAs had uh, lesser known, we'll say, reserved uh, web mails. And what you would do is you would go to the CA and it would say, okay, we're gonna send you an email. Where do you want it? Do you want it at min? Do you want it at hostmaster? And they had like kind of a drop down menu and you could pick whichever one you wanted. Right. So one concrete example of it is uh, there was at least one CA in the whole entire world uh, that would send it to SSL certificates at your domain dot CA. OK, and this was something that I don't know, they, the people at the CA thought it was a good idea, but like no one else really knew about it. OK. And so someone was actually able to go to Microsoft Hotmail, now LiveMail, and literally register SSL certificates at live.com. And that was not a reserved, like they didn't know that there's this one CA somewhere in the world that will give you a certificate to that. But because every CA can issue a certificate for every single website, as soon as they registered that, then they went to the CA and said, okay, I'd like an SSL certificate for live.com, which is like, a huge, you know, that's like all of Microsoft's like infrastructure and they got it, okay? Now, luckily they were actually a security researcher. Uh, so they did it to like kind of prove the point, uh, but we don't know how often this has happened uh, for, for where an actual adversary's just gone and done it and not told everyone uh, that they did it. So the end result of all of this is that you basically get a certificate for Microsoft.
Okay. Um, back to DNS, you, there's other ways of attacking DNS as well, like domain, like DNS poisoning, that kind of stuff. Uh, we won't get into all of those details, but any, take your favorite DNS attack and you could probably use it here uh, to, to intercept this email. Okay, so at the end of the day, is this process, I mean, it's vulnerable to a lot of threats, right? Basically, if you're on the wire, you can probably just intercept the email anyways. And then there's a whole bunch of other ways uh, that you can do it. Um, there's a couple of other things that's, that, uh, that websites will do instead, CAs will do instead. So instead of sending it to you by email, uh, the other options are they'll say, here's something I want you to put it on your website. So put it at domain.ca slash cert dot dat or something like that. Uh, so you put a custom file up and then they go and they go to the and retrieve it from your web server. Okay. And it ends up having basically the same threat profile. So there's no email involved, but still, if you're able to compromise DNS, then you can have it sent to your website. Um, presumably the website itself is not being sent over SSL. If it were, that meant that there was already an SSL certificate. So then I don't know why you're registering for an SSL certificate. It might be that you're renewing, uh, but short of renewing a certificate, if you already have an SSL certificate, you're not trying to get it. So if you're trying to buy an SSL certificate, you probably don't have SSL. So they're fetching this thing that's not over SSL. So if you can sit in the middle, you can just drop in that file. Um, so that, that basically, it doesn't work for all the same reasons that, that email doesn't work. Um, uh, so you put, uh, you basically take the request, you hash it, which just means convert it to a number. Uh, so the request hash, the request for the certificate. So this is the certificate request. Uh, on your website. Or the other options, you could just put it in DNS directly. Uh, and so there are some fields in DNS uh, where you can drop information that, that you want, uh, sort of arbitrary, like, like there's a text field and a few other places that you can abuse uh, to put this in. Okay. But in both cases, if you can compromise DNS, then you can compromise these protocols. If you can intercept uh, this website request, it's much like intercepting the email. Uh, you could also intercept the DNS request. So if, uh, you ask for the DNS record. When it comes back, you change the record. Uh, but this man in the middle would have to be between the CA and their DNS. Okay, so that's going to be a little harder because you're probably not sitting on the wire between VeriSign and their own DNS server. Okay, there are some protocols that are better versions of DNS that wouldn't allow you to do that, like DNSSEC, uh, where there is some authentication. We don't know if CAs use DNSSEC for this or not. Maybe they do, maybe they don't. If I can change the DNS record, it doesn't matter whether it's using DNSSEC. DNSSEC would just sort of protect uh, that actual request and the response and make sure that if someone was changing it, that that, that attack wouldn't work, okay? Uh, but most of these attacks still work uh, on uh, both of these two. And finally, usually CAs give you the option. So they're like, what do you want to do? Do you want an email? Do you want to do it through DNS? Do you want to do it through your website? And so you can always pick the most vulnerable of the three. Okay. Um, so, okay. So this is a way that we can subvert server authentication where we actually get a valid certificate at the end of the day. Uh, so what we're going to do is we're going to subvert the issuance process. This can happen in the DV world or it can happen in the EV world. We'll talk about that in a sec. So in the DV world, it depends on what they're using, but let's use the example of email. Uh, so then we can do all the things that we just said. Um, so we can guess email password, intercept the email. Uh, we can uh, guess the domain registrar password. Uh, we can um, 
subverts the, or we can do some sort of DNS attack, any DNS attack, poisoning, cache poisoning, that kind of thing. Um, we can obtain a reserved email address like SSL certificates at webmail.ca. Okay, uh, so here's a, a bunch of things that we can do. Um, okay, what about the EV world? So the EV world is when we're doing in-person uh, registration. And so here we could do it, we would probably do something that we would call social engineering. Okay, so basically you would have to come with enough documents and some fake identities or something and you would have to convince some human beings either over the phone or in person that you actually are an engineer at Google that's authorized to uh, get certificates for that web service. Okay, And that might be easier than it sounds like could you do it for Google, Microsoft, Twitter, Facebook, I don't know. Could you do it for Concordia? Probably a lot easier. Uh, could you do it for JeremyClark.com? Probably even easier, right? Um, and so, so yeah, there, there's going to be a variety of things. It has happened in real life. Uh, so, for example, with Microsoft, there was someone that they fired, uh, and that person still had a valid ID. And then, I don't know, for revenge or, or for whatever reason, they went to a CA and they still had their employee card, and, and so the CA granted them a certificate. In this case, the certificate wasn't actually for SSL. It was for code signing. Uh, so that's another area that uses certificates. But in principle, uh, the same principle applies to SSL certificates. Uh, they were able to obtain that actual certificate. Okay, so this, anyway, let's go back to the original question. So how do we know the public key to sign the certificate belongs to the CA? Because they come hard bake it, baked and it sort of traces back. Every certificate traces back to something that was hard baked in your computer. If it doesn't, then it's not valid. Uh, how did the CA figure out Google's public key? Well, they figured out maybe using this in-person process or this email thing or that type of thing. Now, what stops you from using that same process? Actually, nothing in principle, right? So I could say, are you really google.ca? Let me send a secret to admin at google.ca, and if you can send it back to me, then I'll believe you. The only problem is I don't want to send those emails. And even if it's automated, it's going to take a little while. And so it's much better to just have one company do it for Google instead of having every Google user do it for Google. Right. Uh, so the only reason that we use CAs really is they're not actually more authoritative than you are at figuring out, especially in the domain validated case, whether that domain actually belongs to that. That key actually belongs to the person who owns that domain or not. OK, they don't have any special tricks. They don't have any special knowledge. They're using a process that you could use as well. Uh, the only difference is it's better to just do it once with one company than to do it millions of times for all of the users themselves, okay? So it's really just an efficiency reason for why we have certificate authorities. They, they, um, they've also done it longer and they have the infrastructure and things like that. So they're, they're maybe a little better, but in principle, they're not actually, um, what we say, authoritative over the information. So here's some lessons that we can learn from this. So. CAs are not actually authoritative. Over uh, which public key belongs to which website.
They don't have any insider information or special technology or anything like that. Uh, what they do instead is they use what we call indirection. Uh, so they rely on DNS, they rely on email, they rely on these other web protocols to work correctly. And if those things work correctly, then they can figure it out. Okay, and what that means is that as an attacker, if you can compromise DNS or email, then you can compromise this issuance process and then you can just get a certificate uh, for uh, whatever website you want. So back to one final thing uh, before we take a break is when I said that DigiNotar and Komodo were breached, uh, it wasn't that their private key was stolen. It was actually just that this whole process was, was breached. And so the adversary was able to just generate a certificate for whatever website they wanted to. So I forget which one was which, they both happen around the same time, but in one case, they they actually know, they had a record or a log of which certificates were issued. And so they issued themselves about 10 or 12 uh, websites. And they were for like the things you would expect, like Google and Facebook and like the big, the big name uh, websites. Okay, questions about the this part of it? Okay, let's take a 10 minute break and then I'll tell you even more attacks on SSL. Um, okay, uh, Okay. questions so far before we, we'll slightly switch gears, but we'll sort of talk around, uh, about similar things. So any questions? Okay. Okay, so let's, uh, we're going to keep looking at SSL and dig a little deeper. Um, so let's go back to just how it works. Um, so just a, a sort of reminder. Here's Alice, here's the server. Alice goes to the domain and says, hey, I want to talk HTTPS. Do you support HTTPS? And so there's a protocol for this in TLS called the Handshake Protocol. Um, we're just going to simplify it. Who cares about all the details? So Alice basically says, hey, I want to talk to you over HTTPS. And the domain, assuming that it does support HTTPS, it will say, great. Uh, yes, let's do that. By the way, here's my certificate or certificate chain. Um, So it will send its site certificate. It will send all the intermediates. Usually it doesn't send a copy of the root certificate because you'll have a copy of it yourself, uh, but it could send it just as a convenience, but you still have to cross check uh, that it matches, okay? And so Alice is then going to say, okay, uh, I'm going to check out this certificate. If I like it, then I'm going to display the lock. Her browser will do this. Uh, if I don't like it for some reason, then I'm not going to display the lock. Okay, uh, so should I display the lock or not? All right, so there's a bunch of things that go into this decision about whether to display the lock. A lot of them we've talked about, some of them we haven't talked about, and we'll talk about it now, okay? Um, so the first thing, uh, it, I won't do it in any particular order, but let me tell you some of the things that are part, in, part of this check, okay? So is this a valid certificate? So the first thing that you can check, even before you start checking signatures and is this signed by the CA and all of that stuff is, you can just check that the certificate actually belongs to domain.ca, right? Like say I own jeremyclark.com, someone's going to facebook.com and I just drop in Jeremy, like I can get a certificate for jeremyclark.com, I own it. But if someone's going to facebook.com, I can't drop in jeremyclark.com, right? If I'm an adversary uh, and say, oh, this is Facebook's, here's a certificate for Facebook saying that their public key is my public key. And then they look at the certificates for jeremyclark.com, not facebook.com, okay? Sounds stupid, but that's one of the most basic checks, okay? So is the certificate actually for the correct domain?
Okay, is it signed uh, by a trusted CA? And chained back. So it's usually not just a single signature, but like a chain. In other words, this certificate signed by someone that signed by someone that signed by a root certificate. Okay, so that would be a valid chain of trust. Um, another thing that that's maybe really stupid, uh, but since we're we're trying to be a little explicit here, um, are all the CAs on this chain are they actually CAs? Like if I can get a certificate for jeremyclark.com, I could be like, oh, hey, I'm a CA. Now I'm going to issue a certificate for google.com. I'm going to sign google.com with the key that's in my jeremyclark.com certificate. My jeremyclark.com certificate is signed by VeriSign and VeriSign is in your root store. Okay, so you do have a chain from this Google certificate that I just made up. It was signed by my certificate. My certificate signed by VeriSign. That sounds like a valid chain. Why does that not work? Well, my certificate's not a CA certificate. It's a certificate for a website. So there's some distinction, like not all these certificates are the same. Some of them are CA certificates. Some of them are not CA certificates, right? How do you know the difference? If you're looking at a certificate, how do you know if this is a CA certificate or not, right? How do you make sure that, uh, that the certificates, except for that very last certificate, all the other ones are actually CA certificates, okay? Um, so are the CAs in the chain actually CAs? I mentioned that certificates only last a year or two. I teased the idea that this is for security reasons. Why is that for security reasons? Well, maybe your certificate gets compromised. Okay, so sometimes that happens. Then if there's a shelf life, at least the window of opportunity to use that fake certificate is limited somehow. It's not going to last forever. Okay, um, so uh, in order for it to show the lock, we're going to check whether the certificate is still valid. Okay, is it not expired? Um, so the certificate has not expired. We'll do that using the system clock. So the browser will know what time it is because browsers know. Obviously, if I can manipulate your clock, then I could also manipulate this. You may have experienced this yourself. Um, so I've had times where um, uh, I don't know, for some reason on my computer, if I like the battery completely dies, then I turn it back on and it has the wrong time. Like somehow it, it doesn't sync up with the time I have to explicitly get it to sync. But before I get it to sync, my computer's connecting to all these SSL stuff because it's doing all this stuff in the background or maybe I open like Gmail or something like that. Then you might actually see certificate warnings like, oh, this is expired, this is expired, but it's really your computer's out of sync or something like that. Um, so anyway, so. Uh, that's another consideration. And then what happens if you lose your key? So I just got a certificate today. It's good for two years. My key gets compromised tomorrow. Someone steals it. Someone breaks into my computer and they steal my key, right? Um, yeah, I can wait two years, but I don't want people attacking my, my traffic for two years, right? What, what can I do? What can I do if, if, it, gets, uh, if it gets stolen? Okay, so we could revoke it. Um, so what does, that, what does that mean, revoke? So that's the right term. What does that process actually look like? In other words, I'm sending you my certificate today and you're like, oh, this is good. Then I send it to you tomorrow. I send you exactly the same thing. And somehow today you know it's good, but tomorrow you're gonna be like, oh, no, 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 I don't want that, right? That's revoked. Like how, what changed on your end so that you knew that this was good today and not good tomorrow, okay? I'm not going to answer that now, but think about it uh, in the back of your mind. It's harder than it sounds.
Okay, so these are five. There's a little more to the validation than this. There's some other stuff that you have to check, but um, I'm highlighting these five because there's actually been problems in all five of them. So these are, are the, the reasons that I'm, I'm going through all of these, okay? Um, all right, so we go, we ask for the certificate. Maybe it's valid, maybe it's not. Here are five things we're going to check. If we can defeat some of these, so for example, if I can get your browser to accept a certificate for the wrong domain, get your browser to uh, get a certificate that isn't signed by a trusted CA, or maybe change your computer so my CA is trusted even though it didn't come that way, or you know maybe I can use certificates that aren't actually CAs in the chain and get your browser to accept it. Maybe I could just use an expired or a revoked certificate and somehow you don't learn about the fact that it's expired or revoked. These are all opportunities for attack, okay? They're a way to get a certificate that you should not accept, uh, accepted uh, by your browser, okay? Uh, so we have to dig down and make sure that these things are all secure as well, okay? So let's start with the first one. Um, okay, so there, there's kinda, there have been issues with, with all five of these. Okay, so the first one is, does, does the domain match? Uh, do these domains match? Uh, in this case, uh, there was a very high profile bug, and in this case, it was actually just a software bug, okay, uh, that sidestepped this validation. Um, so this was, um, you could sidestep this. <coughs> with a software vulnerability. And uh, this particular vulnerability, it has a nice name, it's called the go-to fail. It happened, um, I don't know, maybe like, I don't know, somewhere between five and 10 years ago, if I recall correctly. Uh, it was pretty like famous when it actually did happen. Uh, and it was a vulnerability on Apple computers, okay? So it was only in Apple's SSL stack. Apple provides its SS, SSL stack through its operating system. So any browser, uh, like Safari browser, uh, or any kind of system, operating system level connections, that type of thing, they would all go through Apple's own um, SSL library. If you had Chrome on it, uh, it may not be true today, but I believe it would just default to SSL. Uh, if you have Firefox, I believe it came with its own SSL library. So Firefox on an Apple computer wasn't vulnerable to this. But anyway, there was a huge class of things that were. And then, of course, you can think about mobile devices, too. So your iPhones and, and that kind of stuff. Uh, so this was in Mac OS. And S Tunnel is their name for their secure tunnel library or their SSL uh, library. Okay, um, so this was actually just something that happened in the code. Okay, so the code was written in a certain way and it ended up being vulnerable uh, to, to, to some attack. And it's kind of cool, so I'll show it to you. And even if you don't, if you're not a programmer or something like that, you can probably uh, follow this without too much effort. Um, okay, so this is what the code looked like. Uh, so this is S tunnel code, highly simplified. Okay, so what the thing was doing, this actually, the error happened in the exact module that was kind of doing this type of thing. So it had a list of checks. So you just got a certificate, now you're gonna check it out and make sure that it's okay, okay? And there was, so there was check one, check two, check three. I don't know what all, the, all they were, but there's a lot of like little details that you have to check. Like, does this string exactly match the string in the certificate and like all this kind of stuff, okay? We'll just think at a higher level of, uh, the library is doing a bunch of checks on the certificate, okay? And what it's going to do is if it sees a check that fails, it's going to set a variable called error. So it's going to flip it to one and then it's going to fail, okay? 
Uh, and so the way the code was set up was like this. Uh, you have a, a variable, we'll just call it error. Uh, so this is a variable. And inside of this, it was just a Boolean. So zero means that there's no error. One means that there's an error. Okay, and so initially it was probably set to zero. Okay, so the way the code was organized is you would do a check. You would either pass the check or you would fail the check. If you pass the check, then you put error, you set error equal to zero. Okay, and if you fail it, you set error equal to one. Okay, then what you want to do is you want to do a second check. And a third check, whatever. And so you can have a whole bunch of, of these checks. Okay, so you do check one, and let's say check one's okay. Error is set to zero, okay, meaning that there's no error. Then what you're going to do is you're going to go from here, and you'll go down to check two. Let's say check two passes, then you'll go from here down to check three, etc. Now let's say check one fails. If check one fails, is there any point in checking, doing check two? No, it failed already, so the whole thing's going to fail. You could save a bit of time. And so what they did is they went to, uh, they basically said, okay, let's skip all of these next lines and we'll just jump to the bottom, okay? And so the jump to the bottom was called fail. So they had a condition called fail at the end. And all fail would do is it would return whatever happened to be an error. And so the idea here is that um, uh, if you pass the test, you go on to the next one. If you fail, you just go directly to fail. Error is set to one, and so one gets passed uh, back to the calling method. Uh, if you failed check two, same thing, you would jump down to fail. If you failed check three, you would jump down to fail. Uh, so that's all great, okay? Now, if you made it, and let's say you pass all the checks, you actually could just run this line of code, even though it's called fail. Um, in that case, it would return error, but because error is still at zero, then it's going to return zero, saying that there's no error at all, okay? Uh, so this line of code, basically you run through this until you hit this line of code. You're either hitting it because you passed all the tests all the way down, or you're hitting it because you shortcutted to it because you failed one of the tests, then you just return error, okay? So that's great. Um, let me put it in kind of more code format because I, I find it a little easier. But I promise you that if you can understand this diagram, the, the code kind of format is exactly the same. Um, so you might have a statement like an if statement. You'll have this error variable and you'll write into it whether condition one is true or not. Okay, so you take condition one, you write it into error, and if error is not equal to zero, okay, uh, meaning now it's one, or we could say if error equals one, that means that condition one failed. Okay, so you just overwrote this with one. Uh, then what you wanna do is you wanna go to fail. If when you write condition one into error, and error is equal to zero, then you won't go to fail, you'll skip it. Okay, you'll go down to the next line of code. Okay, now the reason I'm putting this in an if is, is actually kind of important, but um, okay. So what we have is we have this just repeated. So it's like, you know, is the certificate signed? Is it, does it match the domain? Blah, 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 blah. Okay, so it was just doing uh, a bunch of these different tests.
Okay, so one, two, three, four. And then at the end, we have fail. So go to fail means literally go down to this line of code that's marked as fail. And uh, all fail would do is return the value in R. Okay. All right, so this is all great. Okay, and this code works. There's nothing wrong with this code yet. Okay, uh, the reason it's called uh, go to fail is uh, something happened that uh, we don't know why, uh, but let me show you what happened and then we can speculate about why. So the code worked exactly like this, except for, for some reason, one of these conditions, let's call it condition two, had two go to fails. Okay? I don't know why. Maybe uh, it was a mistake, right? People were copying and pasting code from somewhere. Maybe someone tried to delete some condition that was between the two and they only deleted the if statement and not the go to fail. Maybe someone really knew what they were doing and they thought this looked like a very innocuous mistake, but it actually has humongous consequences and they put it in. Okay? Don't know the story, but anyway, this is what the code looked like. Okay? What's the consequences? of this line, okay? So let's think this through. So let's do a little code trace here, okay? So I'm gonna start at the top, and let's say condition one is false. Then I'll set error to zero, I'll go to fail, and I'll return zero, uh, meaning that I return an error, okay? Um, actually, I guess I have this reversed. Um, oh no, sorry, okay, okay, sorry. All right, so let's say condition is false. Uh, then what I'll do is I'll return, uh, I'll, I'll set this equal to one. Now error is not equal to zero, so I'll go to fail. Then I'll return one. And so that works as we'd expect, okay? Let's say conversely condition one is true, okay? Uh, so there's no error, so we keep this at zero. It's not equal to zero, so now we go to condition two, okay? Let's say condition two through an error. Condition two through an error, then error gets set to one. This is now true, we go to fail, we end up returning one, okay? What if condition one and condition two are true? So if condition one is true, we skip over this go to fail. If condition two is true, then error is still equal to zero, so this is not true, okay? So are we going to go to fail? Okay, if condition two is equal to zero, meaning that there is no error, will we Will we execute this first go to fail? No. 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 Okay. We won't execute this first one because this if condition is not true. Okay. What about the second? The second one is under the same if. Is this if if error equals zero? Don't do any of these things. How do you know? Like, are both of these under the if, or is just one of them under the if? Okay. So in the programming language, probably C or whatever, uh, there is a notation of curly brackets. So if I did this, then that's fine, actually. There's no consequence to it. If I don't put the curly brackets, what it says is the next line is under the if, and then everything after the next line is just gonna get executed regardless, okay? So let's assume that this throws an error. Then what happens is uh, this will not get executed, will get skipped over, but this will get executed always, okay? So this will always be executed. So we'll always, as soon as we hit this line of code, uh, we'll go down to fail. And then what gets returned? Re error gets returned. Okay, so if there was no error, right, uh, then error is zero, and so zero gets re returned. So whoever is calling this assumes you just did check one, two, three, and four, and there was no error, okay? The problem is, did you actually do check three and four? Did this code ever get executed? Well, the only way, if there's an error anywhere, you always jump down here, okay? So the only way that three and four get executed is if there's no errors. But the problem is if there's no error here and no error here, then we're going to hit the second go to fail and we're always going to make that jump, okay? And because we always make that jump, this code here will never get executed. It's what we call unreachable code, okay? So it's code that, that will never be reached.
do something a little lighter. Okay, so this is all unreachable. Now, remember, this is about validating some certificate. Let's say you coughed up a certificate that whatever condition one was, it's true. Whatever, excuse me, whatever condition two was, that's true. But condition three was not true for your certificate. Would it pass this test? Yeah. It would, right? Because condition three never gets checked, okay? So what was condition three for, you know, whatever it is in their code, what were those conditions that were unreachable that were actually never checked? So one of them, the most prominent one, was the check, does this certificate actually match the correct domain? So it turns out that you didn't even get that far before you skipped and you hopped down to go to fail and it never did that check. So what does that mean? So what that means is I have a certificate for jeremyclark.com. You're trying to go to facebook.com. I just drop in my jeremyclark.com certificate and your browser is like, uh, I checked out this certificate and yeah, it's valid. Okay. Even though it's for completely the wrong domain. Okay. Um, and so maybe it checked that it was signed. Maybe those were the things that were in check one and two. You know, it was actually signed by a CA. Like all those things are true about the certificate. There's only one small problem, which is it's for a completely different website, but that code was skipped over. Okay. So all because of that copy and paste fail, one simple line of code, right? Go to fail repeated twice. The consequences are that it just brings down SSL, like for all Apple users, essentially. Um, so yeah. Okay. All right. So anyway, so a little change could uh, have like big consequences. So that's one lesson. So one whole lesson from this whole attack tree is that any little thing, you know, a corrupt government, you know, one breach in one SSL server, someone using SSL certificates at domain.ca to send email to one go to fail, you know, almost like I guess eight characters of code in a huge library on a huge operating system and you can kind of bring the whole system down. Um, now, once this was found, so it was found, uh, then all these people came out of the woodwork and said, oh, well, like they should have done this, they should have done that. Like we have a static analysis tool and our static analysis tool would have flagged that. It was said, there's this big block of code that's unreachable. Right. And that's all true. It's probably true that their analysis tools would do it. The problem with those kinds of tools is that it would find this bug, but it would also find 10,000 other things that it would also label as a bug that aren't actually bugs. And so some person has to sit, some poor developer has to sit down and figure out, is there actually any real bugs in the 10,000 things that this thing flagged? Um, so that's why it's, it's a lot. It's easy to say, well, my tool found this bug. But what else did it find? How many false positives went along with that? Um, they should have done unit testing. So unit testing would be, let's create a bunch of fake certificates that we know are not valid. Let's try everything we can think of. And one of the simplest ones would be a mismatched domain. Let's throw it at the library and see what happens. And then it, to their shock, if it accepted a certificate that was for the wrong domain, then they could go back and try and figure out why that was happening, okay? So they didn't do adequate unit testing. But anyway, so these these are, um, these are things that, uh, that are difficult. So you need better code review. So tools like static analysis, which just reads your source code, looks for it doesn't know what's right or wrong, but it can do things like say, hey, you just wrote 10 lines of code and you'll never reach it. So that would be a, a fairly simple thing that it could flag. And then unit tests being 
you actually test it out on on certificates that you know the outcome of. You should know that these ones pass and these ones don't. And then you can do fuzzing where you create one certificate and you kind of mutate it in a bunch of different ways and then you try and figure out uh, other things. But anyways, this isn't in other classes in CIC you'll uh, you'll learn about secure code stuff. Okay, let's go back to our list. Certificate for the correct domain. Okay, let me show you one other attack that's on, on along the lines of this issue. Okay, so one domain matches. So here's another domain matches attack. Okay, let's say you go to a, a CA. And you say, I want a certificate. Here's my website. And you say, uh, you know, my website, it looks kind of weird, the domain name. Don't, don't, don't bother with why it looks kind of weird. But um, anyways, this is what it looks like. It looks like google.com null character uh, jeremyclark.com okay so that's fine it's kind of weird what's a null character so null character is just a special character essentially uh, that could be interpreted by code as meaning different things okay um, and so what happens is this, this vulnerability is very specific. It's not going to always generically work. Um, but what, what do you do with this null character? Okay, what, if someone comes along and says, I want this domain, what are you going to do with it? And so the way I see it, there's three sensible options. Okay, one option is you can say, that's not a valid character. You're not allowed to have special characters in domain name, so we'll just drop it. Okay, so I think that you're actually registering Google dot comjeremyclark.ca, okay? That's one sensible approach. Another sensible approach would be like, try again, like that's not valid at all, like just try and give me something that's valid. And then a third sensible approach is the way a computer might look at that, which is a computer might say, hey, I'm you know running code that was written in the language C. For me, strings in the language C uh, I have to know when I hit the end of a string. So basically, if there's a string in memory, you're going to point me to the first character, Google, right? The G in Google. And then I'm just going to walk that string. And when I hit a null character, that's my special signal that this string is, we reach the end of it, okay? So these are called null terminated strings. So some languages work that way. Some languages don't work that way, okay? Now, how you read this will have big consequences, right? So if I drop the null character, this looks like google.comjeremyclark.ca, okay? So that's one domain. Uh, if I null terminate it, then it looks like a string for google.com, okay? Uh, and so uh, depending on, now if everybody treats that string the same way, there's no vulnerability here, okay? The vulnerability arises when different computers or different systems treat the string differently. So some people look at it one way and other people are going to look at it a different way. And there's different ways of setting this up. But in this particular example, what we're going to assume is that when you go to a CA and ask for a certificate, it's going to parse it one way. And then when you actually take that certificate and give it to a browser, the browser is going to treat it differently. Okay. Um, and so apparently there were some browser CA combinations that this worked on for a while. Uh, this problem's kind of long fix, but anyways. Um, so the way it would work is, let's say you have a CA. And let's say the CA would just drop the special character. Okay. 
then basically it would say, okay, it looks like you're trying to register uh, google.com Jeremy Clark .ca. So this is fine. This is just a subdomain of com Jeremy Clark .ca. Okay. This is something the adversary could own. Okay. They could probably go out and register com Jeremy Clark at uh, .ca. Okay. Uh, so let's assume that the adversary actually owns this. Then the CA is going to be like, okay, whatever. I'm going to send an email to admin at com Jeremy Clark .ca. The adversary actually owns this domain, so no problem. It replies, and now it gets uh, a certificate issued for it. Okay. Now you have to make some weird assumptions that that what's a what's a like I said, it kind of threaded the needle. Like when the CA drops the character here, but then when it actually issues the certificate, instead of dropping the character, it just sort of copy and paste this in. Uh, that's the assumption that that you have to make that that makes this attack work so we'll assume that the certificate preserves the null character so in the certificate itself it actually just signed a certificate for google.com null jeremy clark.ca so it basically says okay here's this weird domain and here's the key uh we validate that this is correct we're going to sign off on it as the ca okay and we'll assume that this is some trusted ca okay then the problem, then what happens is you go, uh, you find some user out in the world who's trying to go to google.com, okay? You see someone going to google.com and you know that they have a browser and their browser is going to interpret this different. Their browser is written in C. And so their browser is going to see this null character and think that that's a terminated string, okay? So uh, I, the victim's browser Okay, uh, we're going to assume that it uh, is going to treat this as a null terminated string. And so when it looks at this certificate, it sees a certificate for what? So it's like, okay, what's the host? I have to make sure that the host name matches. So the host name starts here at, at this G. So G O O G L E dot com null. Okay, I'll stop there. Right, and so it sees it as a certificate for Google.com. Okay, and so this certificate, which was issued to the owner of com Jeremy Clark.ca, can be used to impersonate Google.com to browsers who will treat this thing as a null terminated string as opposed to dropping the special character. Okay, so this can be impersonated. Okay, so anyways, this is a sort of really weird bug, uh, but it did exist. Uh, and um, yeah, so now you have to be like really careful. Um, first off, you might read this one way of, okay, null characters, you got to be careful of. But there's a more general principle here, which is every time you write something down, code has to parse it, right? And the way that... Uh, two different software stacks, one that the CA is running and one that the browser is running, any difference in how they parse basic things could potentially be exploited. Not all of them are going to be as quite as fantastic as this uh, particular attack, uh, but it is theoretically possible to, uh, to, to, to try and um, to try and exploit that difference in parsers. And it's really hard to write two parsers that parse strings exactly the same way. That's a lot. It sounds like something that should be easy, but it's actually really, really hard, okay? Especially if they're written in completely different languages, okay? And so uh, when this attack came out, this was one example, but they actually had a whole bunch of other fields that uh, your browser and the CA may uh, interpret different, and, and there were some other consequences. But anyways, I pulled this one out because it was kind of, the easiest to understand, even though it might not be that easy to understand. Okay, questions about this? Okay, so another little small thing that kind of brings the whole house of cards, you know, tumbling down. Okay, uh, so let's go back to our issues. Okay. Two, uh, 
is the certificate actually signed by a trusted CA or like a CA that chains back to a trusted CA? So what happens if I just make up a CA? CA is not trusted, it's not signed. The CA certificate isn't signed uh, by an actual certificate authority that's in the certificate authority store. You're going to google.com. I just drop in my certificate for google.com that says google.com's public key is my public key. It's signed by someone you've never heard of. Uh, it's going to fail that verification, right? What does that look like for the end user? Let's say it wasn't though. Okay, so here we're going to, we're basically going to just use an invalid certificate. So we have a certificate, we know it's valid, but we're going to use it anyway. First off, does anyone actually use invalid certificates? Okay, so there's a bunch of sites that'll issue what's called a self-signed certificate. <coughs> self-signed certificate is just, I sign it myself. You don't know who I am, you don't trust it. Uh, it's slightly better than using no certificate at all for, for reasons that we won't get into. Um, and so, yeah, on the web, people would use self-signed certificates sometimes. So it wasn't completely crazy that you would see a self-signed certificate, okay? So what would happen? Would the browser say, uh, n like, just connect to it and not show the lock? Would it say you're not allowed to connect to it and not connect it to you? Would it show you a warning? Well, you know, what, what warning would you expect? Okay. All right, so if you just drop in an invalid circuit certificate, sorry, you get a warning. Okay, and this is actually true of any property, but I'm picking up on this one property. It could be a mismatched domain or whatever, okay? Okay, so the user sees a warning, so you're done, right? The user will not connect to your web server. So they're trying to go to facebook.com. You drop in your fake Facebook certificate now the user has a warning, right? So they're not going to connect to what they think is facebook.com using your fake certificate because they see this warning, right? They can, they can still say, go ahead and... Okay, so, so maybe the br browser interface lets you click through the warning. So maybe it's like, you know, the certificate isn't valid, but maybe you want to visit that website anyways, okay? Now, it turns out that browsers five, 10 years ago were a lot different than browsers today, okay? Um, so let me start five, 10 years ago. Five, 10 years ago, so you're a user, you're trying to go to facebook.com. You get some warning that talks about SSL tunnels and certificates and signatures and certificate authority, right? Put yourself in the shoes of someone who's 10 or 20 years older than you. Do you know what any of that means? No, you don't know. It just sounds like techno jumble mumble. You really want to go to facebook.com, right? You want to see those pictures. Uh, what are you going to do? You're going to click, you can click the button that lets you go to facebook.com, right? Or you can say this mumble jumble like somehow means I sh can't go to facebook.com today, right? What are you going to do? You're just going to click through. Okay, so there were attacks like this um, where people were caught in the wild just dropping invalid certificates actually for facebook.com. Okay, so they were signed, uh, it happened in Syria, it was signed like Syrian Telecom. But the thing about a fake certificate is you can actually make up, because it's fake, you can make up anything. So no one knows really like if it was actually the Syrian government or not. But anyways, it was just an invalid certificate. They dropped it into connections and users at that time would have just had a warning and we don't know how many click through but i'm willing to bet that probably a lot of them click through there were some usability academic studies where they brought people into a lab they showed them warnings with fake certificates they didn't tell them what the study was about but it was really about measuring how many of them would click through and i forget what the statistics were but it was something like 80 percent click through or something like that so it was really really bad okay now the community kind of woke up, and so Google in particular, they said, okay, this, is, this looks bad. First off, there were some questions about the study, but anyways, between, they hired a bunch of usability experts, and they really tried to, let's get these warning messages so that people can understand them, right? So now they're a lot more sensible. Let's make it a lot harder to click through. So you gotta like, 
basically say, yes, I'm willing to go to this super insecure site or I forget exactly how it, I use Safari, so I don't, I don't really see Google stuff very often. But uh, my understanding is that they uh, were able to tweak the messaging. They made it a lot harder to click through, so you wouldn't just intuitively click, you know, continue, continue, continue. It was kind of like buried, or you had to expand some text to find that button or something like that. So still technically possible to click through, but they were able to bring the click through rate way, 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 way down. So they, they scared the heck out of you and then, yeah. Uh, and so now it's like, I don't know, I think in their latest studies, like less than the percent or something like that click through, or it might even be less than 1% or something like that. Okay. Um, but anyways, it wasn't always that way. So if you just use an invalid certificate, you see a warning. Uh, the warning was often sort of obtuse, uh, filled with jargon. So people didn't understand what they were doing and it was super easy to click through. Like there was a big continue button basically just begging you to like, don't even read this, just hit the button. Um, so they made it easy to click through. So we have improved, I'll call it usable security. So this is a, a consequence of uh, usability combined with security. So we have improved usable security uh, that has reduced click-throughs. I'll just note that there was the example of the, I'll put in quotes, the Syrian <coughs> telecom. So we don't know who it was because self-signed certificates, you can write anything else. And do I have the statistics for the earlier studies? Okay, I don't know. But anyways, uh, the, the rates were really bad and then they worked on reducing it, okay? So the idea of the adversary is they don't try to suppress the warning, they just sort of tolerate it and they hope that people click through. And just if they get enough to click through, like maybe they're not actually trying to read everyone's Facebook account, they just want to kind of look at 1% of the population or 5% of the population or something like that, then that might be acceptable uh, to them. Okay, third one, are the CAs in the chain actually CAs? Okay, so this might bear some explanation. Um, so let me just sort of outline the attack. I'll explain it in words. Okay, so let's say that you come to my website, uh, jeremyclark.com. And I say, okay, here's my key. Let me just do a little better try. My key is whatever. And by the way, I have a certificate and it's signed by some CA. And you say, okay, that looks great, but how do I know that that CA is actually uh, reputable? How do I know they're actually a CA? Then you say, no problem, I have a second certificate. Uh, this certificate is for that CA, saying that their key is indeed the same key that signed my certificate. And this certificate was signed by some CA prime. And by the way, you know all about CA prime because that's in your root store. Okay, so in your key store you have CA prime. Okay, now the question is what stops me from saying, hey, I want to intercept Google traffic. 
So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to create a certificate for, or let's do Facebook. So I'm going to do facebook.com and I'm going to say their key is some value that I know I just made it up and uh, this is a signed certificate. Who signed it? Well, JC signed it. This guy. This guy who has this signature from this CA that has this signature from this CA that's in your key store. Okay, is this a valid chain? Why is it not a valid chain? Okay, so there's something about this certificate that says, yes, this is a CA. There's something about this certificate that says, yes, this is a CA. And then there's gotta be something about this certificate that says, this is a certificate, it's just not a CA certificate, right? It's a site certificate or it's something else, okay? And then when I see this, I'm going to check, is this a CA or not? As soon as I see it's not, then that's fine. Hopefully I don't go to fail, skip over uh, that particular check, okay? So first question, how do I know whether a, cert a certificate's a CA or not? So there's a flag for it. Uh, it's, it's actually really simple. Uh, it's uh, just labeled CA. Uh, it's in a category called basic constraints. So let's take a look at uh, Google certificate. So let's first look at an actual CA certificate. So we'll look at the intermediate certificate, which is also from Google. Okay. And so if we go to the details, you see there's a bunch of uh, different things. Um, And somewhere there will be the basic constraints field. Okay, so it's right here. Okay, so right here, there's something called basic constraints. And under it, there's a field called certificate authority, and the answer is yes. Okay, so that tells me that this certificate actually is a CA. It's able to sign certificates, site certificates, okay? So not only do you trust it because it links back to a root certificate, but it itself can issue new certificates, okay? There's also a what's called the path line constraint, and that means if it's set to zero, it means it can issue certificates, but it can't issue CA certificates that could in turn issue certificates. So uh, once you hold a site certificate like google.com, that has to be, uh, there can't be any CAs between you and this, okay? So it only authorized them for like kind of one degree so Google can't turn around and say, hey, Marks and Spencer, you're now a CA. Marks and Spencer issues the site certificate because then when your browser got back to Google, it would say, well, actually, Mark, or the, the site is actually degree one removed. So there's me, this certificate, there's uh, Marks and Spencer CA, then there's the actual site. Okay, so that's a length, a hop of one away, but this is saying, well, the length has to be zero. Okay, so it can't be any greater than zero. So anyways, it, it's a way of kind of controlling certificates, not an important part. Uh, what I want you to concentrate on is just this flag called yes. So let's just check, well, we can check the root certificate. And um, so root certificate here, basic constraints, certificate authority is set to yes. Notice there is no path length, so it can issue whatever it wants. Uh, and then for Google, which is a site certificate, Here's the basic constraints, and you can see that certificate authority is set to no. Okay. Uh, question. Uh, yeah. Like when we configure or like in this way, like uh, authorities certificate yes or no during creation of certificate. Good question. Uh, so let me not answer that and let you think about the answer. So when, when is this flag set?
Okay, so it's, it's set when these certificates sort of come into existence, and in particular when, uh, when the person actually signs them. Uh, let me, sorry, just let me highlight this first and then I'll. Okay. All right, so this certificate was created. So the way it works is basically Google will go to Google Internet Authority and they'll say, hey, I penciled in my certificate. So they'll put in all the details of what they want to appear. This is called a certificate status request, a CSR, um, or certificate request status. I forget, I have the acronym wrong. But anyways, there's a special technical name for it. Uh, it's basically all the certificate just not signed. So they send that to the certificate authority. Certificate authority does whatever checks it needs to check. When they're satisfied at the end of the day, they say, okay, now I'll sign your uh, request and then they'll sign it. So one of the checks they'll do is they'll make sure that you didn't set that flag to yes. Uh, so they're supposed to do that. So there might be another vulnerability. I've never seen it in the wild where someone goes to a certificate authority, they're asking for a site certificate, but they end up getting a CA or they say, can you give me a CA? Or they say, can you give me a site certificate, but they set it equal to yes or something like that. So I've never seen that attack happen, but it, it's possible uh, that, that that might happen. Um, but anyways, whenever this was signed, that's when that flag got locked in. What if I just took this certificate and I flipped this from a yes to a no to a yes? So I send this exact certificate. The only difference is I change this to a yes. Then Google.com can sign up then google.com or jeremyclark.com can sign other things. Okay, what stops me from just flipping it to a yes? The signature won't match. Okay, the signature won't match. Okay, so as soon as I change the content, the signature uh, on this certificate, the signature of Google Internet Authority won't match this message anymore. Okay, digital signatures are super sensitive by design. If you change one bit of the message that was signed, then the signature is no longer valid. So it, it locks in that message exactly down to the bit. OK, uh, so I can't just go and flip it. OK, now what did happen is people did this attack. OK, and what they realized is that actually, for whatever reason, some implementations weren't actually doing this check. OK, so really early in the history of computers uh, for, yeah, for whatever reason, people weren't actually doing this check. OK, uh, so this attack, even though it shouldn't have worked, uh, there was a, an implementation bug or whatever you want to call it. A uh, flaw. Um, so there was a flaw. So it's called the basic constraints flaw because that's the field. So this was found by uh, someone named Moxie Marlinspike, who's a hacker who also did some work on the parsing bugs and has done a lot of stuff in the SSL space, especially early SSL. Um, so it's called basic constraints and um, yeah, so I don't have the actual versions. Um, so it, it was von Windows was vulnerable to it very early. I forget how early, like 90s, like that kind of thing. Uh, so some early version of Windows did it. He pointed it out. Everyone's like, wow, that's embarrassing. That's really stupid. Um, we'll never do that again, right? Like that, that's something that like people did back in the 90s when they didn't really think about these protocols. Now we're really super, super careful, right? And so we'll never see this again. Then the iPhone came out and the very first version of the iPhone had the exact same vulnerability in it. So iOS. So people didn't learn from history. Uh, yeah, and so they, it was vulnerable to the exact same thing. Now, there's nothing that we know about that's vulnerable, but I can imagine that there's probably a lot of IoT devices or something like that that, that this might work on. Yeah. Yeah, uh, so I have a little bit of a second flaw, uh, Yeah, so uh, for the self-signed certificate for this one here, yeah. yeah. So the idea is what I'll do is I want to intercept your traffic to Facebook.com. I'm not Facebook.com's and I don't have a certificate for Facebook.com. 
So what I'll do instead is I'll just do a self-signed certificate or some certificate that uh, looks like it traces back to a CA, but it's no CA that you've ever heard of. I just make up those values. And then I drop it into a victim trying to connect to the real Facebook.com. So they'll say, hey, Facebook.com, send me your certificate. Facebook.com will send back the certificate. Then I'll drop in my fake certificate. So the user gets this fake certificate. Now it's holding it, it's deciding, okay, am I actually talking to Facebook.com or not, right? And it's browser saying, you probably aren't warning, warning, warning. And the user's like, I don't care. And then just clicks through. So that's the attack. And then once they click through, then that certificate's the one that's being used. So all their traffic, their tunnel doesn't end at Facebook.com anymore. It ends at me, the adversary that's in the middle. So the only way you can fix it is by making users not click through the warnings, essentially. So you could actually just turn it off. Then you would kill all self-signed certificates as well. Uh, so you could just say, we're, we're never going to allow an invalid certificate. There's also different like kind of levels of invalid. So like if a certificate's expired, is that a big deal? It's probably not that big of a deal. Like it probably is just expired. Right. And it worked yesterday. And, and, and does all security turn off because yesterday it was secure and then today it's not because of some date that was written in the certificate? Probably not. Right. So sometimes the browsers, depending, they'll give different warnings for different kinds of errors. But a, a domain mismatch or uh, this isn't signed by a CA that we recognize, those are like serious errors. Right. Those are, are real indications. If it's just expired, then it, like the it, you could be man in middle, but the person would have had to actually compromise a, a certificate that was actually trustworthy at some point. So that's like a much milder kind of form of thing. So there they might make it easier to click through if it's just expired. But yeah. Uh, why uh, why do we make certificates like with expiration dates? So the main thing is just so that they have a limited shelf life, so that if anything is compromised. Uh, then you can attack it forever. Uh, then it will just expire in a year or two, right? Now, but why don't we just revoke it, right? If it's, we have a mechanism for revocation, so we could just revoke it. Then we have like 10 year certificates or 15 year certificates. And if they expire, or sorry, if they get compromised, then we'll just revoke it. So the answer to that is revocation actually doesn't work, essentially. That's really the bottom line. Uh, so I'll talk about what we try to do with revocation. It's going to be next class now. Uh, but uh, revocation is a total mess. Um, so yeah, if revocation worked better, then we could have longer lived certificates. But because we can rely less and less on revocation working, then people have shortened the certificate lifespan. Isn't it like if you have a short life, it's basically Say it again. Yeah, if you have a short life, yeah. Yeah, so there could be economic reasons for sure. So uh, CAs usually charge you more for like a two-year certificate than one year. But yeah, it's good business for them. If you have to renew every year, absolutely. That's, that could be another reason as well. Yeah. Okay, we're out of time. Uh, we're almost on this attack tree. I'll fill in some of the nodes offline and then maybe another half lecture and then we'll be done and move on to new things. So I'll see you next week. Thanks.